Whether they feature shocking twists or important character developments, these sequel and prequel moments made it impossible for us to watch our favorite movies and shows the same way again. It's safe to say that the truth about Darth Vader, that he used to be Anakin Skywalker, is no longer much of a spoiler, but it sure was back in 1980. It's probably the most famous twist in sci-fi history, and it wasn't even in the filmmaker's original plans. Judging by earlier versions of the script, George Lucas had initially intended for Darth Vader and Anakin to be two separate characters. The idea didn't even occur to him until he was working on The Empire Strikes Back, and the twist was originally proposed as a joke, according to Marsha Lucas. Yet amazingly, so many things from the original movie make sense in retrospect. In fact, fans can re-watch the scene from A New Hope where Obi-Wan tells Luke about Anakin and find several clues that suggest the old master wasn't telling the whole truth, even if they were purely coincidental. When Obi-Wan tells Luke about Uncle Owen's relationship with Anakin, his delivery suggests that he might be hiding something important. He didn't hold with your father's ideals, thought he should have stayed here and not gotten involved. Likewise, when Luke asks how his father died, Obi-Wan pauses noticeably before answering. He is technically lying when he tells Luke that Vader betrayed and murdered Anakin, but if you want to be more generous, you could say that Obi-Wan is simply being metaphorical. Since the beginning of the MCU, one thing has seemed certain. S.H.I.E.L.D. is on the side of the good guys. After all, the organization assembled the Avengers and consistently worked against malevolent villains like Loki and the evil Hydra organization. However, Captain America the Winter Soldier changed all that, as Steve Rogers discovers that S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA have become one and the same. Since the events of the first Captain America movie, HYDRA has slowly infiltrated the ranks of S.H.I.E.L.D., and they're hijacking S.H.I.E.L.D.'s weapons and resources to carry out its agenda. The sequel forces Captain America to begin questioning authority and re-examine his assumptions about right and wrong. Likewise, it made Marvel fans feel a little guilty for cheering at S.H.I.E.L.D.'s previous victories fans will realize with horror that Hydra must have been working behind the scenes the whole time, even during the Battle of New York in The Avengers. Hydra grew right under your nose and nobody noticed. Why do you think we're meeting in this cave? I noticed. How many paid the price before you did? It's also worth noting that Captain America the Winter Soldier set an entirely new precedent for the MCU. Fans no longer had to wait for the next Avengers movie to see plot points that would have a major impact on other Marvel films. This sequel proved that the events of one solo movie could ripple outward to affect the entire MCU, something we've seen many times since. In Finding Nemo, Dory's short-term memory loss is pretty much just a running gag. Sure, it moves the plot forward and helps Marlin become a better parent, but it's still mostly played for laughs. Upon watching Finding Dory, though, fans will discover that the lovable Blue Tang has her own tragic backstory to tell. Finding Dory shows how much of a nightmare it can be to live in constant fear that you'll forget about the people you love. Viewers can feel the pain of Dory's parents as they worry about how their daughter will be able to take care of herself, and for the first time, audiences know what it's like to see the world through Dory's eyes. In particular, the montage at the beginning of the movie, which shows young Dory growing up alone, cements to viewers how little they truly understood Dory in the first movie. These moments from Finding Dory add a whole new layer to Finding Nemo if you watch it again. Not only do we learn the origins of her Just Keep Swimming song, but her monologue in which she begs Marlin not to leave her becomes even more poignant when you realize just how many people have left Dory before. Likewise, some of the jokes from the first film will take on a much sadder undertone. I forget things almost instantly. It runs in my family. Well, I mean, at least I think it does. Uh, hmm, where are they? Fans who love the faithful android Bishop and Aliens are undoubtedly devastated when the character dies in Alien 3. However, in the climax of the third movie, they find themselves unsettled rather than joyous when Bishop appears to be back from the dead. It turns out that this isn't Bishop, rather it's the man who built him. Known only as Bishop 2, this employee of the Wayland yutani Corporation designed the android to look exactly like him. While the two characters share the same face, they couldn't be more different. Bishop is willing to sacrifice himself to save Ripley, while Bishop 2 cares only about harvesting the xenomorph inside of her. Bishop 2 isn't an android program to carry out the bidding of the company. He's an actual human being who sees the xenomorph as a magnificent specimen. Bishop 2 is just as cunning and callous as Ash from the first movie, but what makes this man somehow worse is that you almost want to believe him. How can you not when he has Bishop's face? If you rewatch Aliens after seeing this moment from Alien 3, you'll never be able to look at Bishop the same way again. 
Norman from Don't Breathe certainly seems like a victim at first glance. After all, he's just a blind man who comes across as pretty defenseless after three teenagers break into his home. Yet, as the movie unfolds, it becomes increasingly clear that Norman is the villain. The sequel, Don't Breathe 2, subverts expectations once again. Early in the movie, viewers see the young girl Phoenix running from Norman's dog. It seems like Phoenix will be Norman's next victim, until the movie reveals that Phoenix is actually Norman's adoptive daughter and he is simply training her how to survive. Fans may be surprised to discover that Norman is actually a protective, albeit icy dad. It's especially shocking to see Phoenix be friendly to the dog that was so terrifying in the original film. I snap my fingers and he'll bite your testicles off. Now Norman is shown as less a villain and more of an anti-hero. It seems he has moved away from kidnapping and rape and has found a more tasteful way of having a child of his own. He rescued Phoenix from a fire and raised her himself. Norman is still definitely ruthless and terrifying, but he's not quite the monster he was in the prequel. It may be difficult for viewers to reconcile these two sides of Norman. Whether you feel that Don't Breathe 2 is humanizing a three-dimensional character or trying to excuse the actions of a despicable one, one thing's for sure. It will completely change how you watch the first film. Jimmy McGill, more commonly known as Saul Goodman, may just seem like a crooked lawyer in Breaking Bad, but the prequel series Better Call Saul adds a whole new layer to his character. Before becoming Albuquerque's scummiest attorney, Jimmy is deeply insecure. He craves approval from his brother Chuck, a once great lawyer who never leaves the house anymore due to his allergy to electricity. Even at his lowest, though, Chuck is still more respected than Jimmy. But the scene from Better Call Saul that reveals the most about Jimmy is the moment from the sixth and final season when Kim breaks up with him. It's especially heartbreaking because she admits that really she does still love him, but they can never be together again. But we are bad for everyone around us. Other people suffer because of us. The breakup is the final straw that completes Jimmy's transformation into Saul. Knowing this about Saul, his callous behavior in Breaking Bad is a bit more understandable. With such a tragic backstory, it's easy to see why he's willing to sell out his own clients, like when he urges Walter to kill Badger in order to save his own skin. This may also explain why Saul is flirting with Skylar one minute and then telling her he can't imagine how she and Walter are still married the next. Perhaps Saul is a bit jealous that Walter managed to maintain his marriage for as long as he did. Aside from being a mightily satisfying payoff for Marvel's Infinity Saga, Avengers Endgame also enriches the previous films in the MCU by changing how we view moments from other movies. The time heist at the center of the film allows fans to revisit several iconic MCU scenes alongside their favorite heroes, but this time they're seen from different angles. For instance, the introduction of Guardians of the Galaxy's Peter Quill is hilariously put in perspective when we see it through the eyes of Nebula and Rhodey. So he's an idiot. Yeah. Meanwhile, the trip to 2012 New York has some more surprises in store. Who would have guessed there would be an epic Captain America vs. Captain America battle in the Avengers Tower that was conveniently omitted from the Avengers? In addition, the movie reminds us that the Hydra-controlled shield had always been lurking in the background of the MCU. Perhaps the most head-spinning reveal is that, after the events of Endgame, Steve Rogers goes back in time so he can be reunited with Peggy and grow old. This means that Peggy Carter's husband, as mentioned in The Winter Soldier, is none other than Cap. The screenwriters of Avengers Endgame have confirmed that Rogers was indeed the father of Peggy's kids. When choosing a villain for the movie Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, the filmmakers turned to the original TV series. After defeating the genetic Superman Khan in the episode Space Seed, Captain Kirk exiles Khan and his people to the uninhabited planet Seti Alpha 5. However, Kirk never bothers to check on them, so he doesn't realize that Khan ends up spending a decade and a half in an uninhabitable wasteland. The sequel film demonstrates that Kirk's well-meaning actions can have far-reaching consequences. The sequel sets a totally different tone from the original series right from the opening scene, in which Lieutenant Savick makes the decision to rescue the imperiled Kobayashi Maru from a neutral zone, endangering the entire crew of the Enterprise. For a moment, it seems like the Klingons have killed everybody, including Spock, but a surprise entrance from Kirk reveals that the whole thing was just a simulation. Although viewers are relieved to learn that none of what they just saw was real, the opening sequence shows fans a darker and more mature version of the Star Trek universe. It's a painful reminder that the crew of the Enterprise might one day need to face a no-win scenario like the one shown in the simulation, and that everyone's a redshirt at the end of the day. Spock actually dies for real later in the movie, 
and even though he's resurrected in the sequels, both his fake and real deaths have had lasting impacts on the Star Trek universe. A running gag in the Big Bang Theory is the roommate agreement that has been established between Sheldon and Leonard. This is a contract that the two roommates have signed to spell out what they can and cannot do while living together, and Sheldon never hesitates to cite the exact clauses that he feels Leonard is violating. I'm here because you violated our roommate agreement, specifically Section 8, Visitor, Subsection C, Females, Paragraph 4, Coitus. A scene from Young Sheldon explains where Sheldon first got this idea as a kid, and it allows fans to understand why Sheldon cares so much about contracts into his adulthood. According to the episode Vanilla Ice Cream, Gentleman Callers, and A Dinette Set, Sheldon's first contract is created to help his Mima while she's dating Dr. Sturgis. Sheldon can't help but overhear the two arguing, and he also can't help spying on them with binoculars. He wants things to work out between Mima and her new boyfriend, so he offers to draft a relationship contract so the couple can establish boundaries. If this relationship's gonna have any chance at all, we have to lay down some ground rules. Great, I love rules. I do too. It's a sweet gesture from Sheldon that shows how much he truly loves his Mima. Of course, this sentimental moment doesn't hold a candle to a certain other scene from The Big Bang Theory involving Sheldon and his Mima. Fans are sure to find Amy's Christmas cookie gift extra bittersweet after watching that particular episode of Young Sheldon. 